Great. Well, good evening um, and a big welcome to you all. And for those of you visiting the Blavatnik School of Government for the first time, a special welcome to you. I'm Nairi Woods and I'm Dean of the School. And it's a very special pleasure tonight to invite Mark Malik Brown to talk to us on Britain at Sea. How can we salvage foreign policy? Mark Malik Brown needs no introduction to most of you, but I think it is just worth underscoring that his, his life, his experience and his leadership have taken him through many roads that make him, that put him in an, a superb position to think about how Britain does position itself at this pretty difficult moment in world politics. Mark was a journalist for The Economist in an early part of his life but really began to, to lead across the international system when he became head of the United Nations Development Program. He took on an, an organization that a lot of people hadn't heard of and really directed it at the problem of governance and how it is that countries could govern themselves better. He, he then served as United Nations Deputy Secretary General, and one of the huge impacts he had in that role was as an architect of the Millennium Development Goals. And the idea that although most countries in the world disagree about many things, they could, under the rubric of the United Nations, come together and agree, every one of them, that there are, or there were then, 10 goals that all governments could pledge themselves to trying to deliver on. That was, that was, a truly fine piece of leadership in getting a global community to find a common area of agreement. Lord Malik Brown then returned to Britain and became a minister in the Foreign Office of Britain. And I'm sure that he will reflect tonight on the change in tempo, influence and experience that one gets from being at the top of the United Nations to coming and serving one nation within the United Nations, that's to say Britain. Um, speaking more locally from the school, right from the very earliest days of the Blavatnik School of Government, uh, Mark Malik Brown has been an extraordinarily wise counsel, um, advisor, supporter, inspirer of the project to build the School of Government, for which we're all enormously grateful and he's been a distinguished visiting practitioner in the school, which from the outset of the school was our desire to actually nominate some leading practitioners whose public service was of the kind that we would like to see all of our students follow. So Mark, for all those reasons, a very particular warm welcome to the Blavatnik School of Government. Thank you. sort of the closest there was to an international government type uh, in, in, in Britain. I was the sort of one non-Oxford academic on the selection panel that chose Nari as dean, so uh, I definitely deserve such nice words of introduction, <laughs> uh, even if they're not quite as uh, dispassionate as, uh, um, and objective as they should be. Um, and, you know, I, I today want to take the liberty of perhaps being only partly academic in what I say, and also being very angrily political at the same time. And, and, you know, I say that as someone who got through most of his career well free of British politics. I mean, I, I always describe myself as a refugee from British politics because um, I, I, uh, my, my, my only attempt to, to be involved in it, having written about it for The Economist, was... Uh, as a would-be social democratic candidate. Um, and uh, I actually was already at the time working for the UN and my director of personnel, one Kofi Annan, um, took an undated letter from me so that I could go and try and seat, seek a social democratic party seat in the election. A letter that came back to haunt me because many years, 30 years later when I was Deputy Secretary General, 
the wits in the press corps would say he's still got that letter and he's going to date it one day soon. Uh, but he had it just in case I got a seat and I didn't. So, but I always say that, you know, really a UN career was the sort of refuge of someone who'd failed so dismally in British politics. So, you know, the fact that I'm back and trying again um, means that at least I, I appear not to learn. And, you know, in that sense, this is all a long way of declaring that I speak as someone very interested in all of this, someone who chairs a group called Best for Britain, which, you know, is a, um, uh, a non-party political group uh, of principally young campaigners uh, supported by a coalition of entrepreneurs, uh, private investors, uh, most infamously, if you were to read the Daily Mail on us, George Soros is one of our donors, uh, but we have some 8,000 donors, and I think we're all collectively you know, pretty angry people at the way we feel Britain has lost its direction at home and abroad, and I, I think it's important to declare that interest uh, at the beginning of this. But let, let me start with sort of framing two hypotheses about how we, where we are in Britain today, and the first and, and they're both about anchors. I'm sorry about this rather strained maritime metaphor, but it seems to me that Britain has lost two anchors uh, to Europe and to the United States. And, you know, it, it, it's uh, in, in that sense a, a Britain that, um, um, you know, can be blamed for one, uh, the severing of the link uh, with Europe. Uh, but the other is an accident, in a way, bad timing, uh, that the effort to leave Europe should coincide uh, with President Trump's arrival in Washington. Uh, but I think together uh, they create an extraordinarily different environment to the one that British diplomats had grown used to operating in. Because we have, in a sense, enjoyed a triangulated standing in our foreign policy. We've been both... America's preeminent link to Europe and Europe's intermediary with Washington. Uh, and now both relationships are in crisis. Um, you know, I think you only have to look at uh, Mrs. May's uh, appearance at the Canadian G7 summit last, last weekend. Uh, and you saw her almost as a stranger, a bit actor on the, uh, the side of things. And, um, you know, I suppose the good news is she didn't elicit the wrath that uh, Justin Trudeau uh, elicited from Donald Trump or, for that matter, Angela Merkel. But there was already a sense of sort of lost, uh, lost uh, relevance. Uh, but, of course... I'm going to come back to it, this, this in a sense, uh, loss of those two uh, positioning points, the two legs to the stool of, 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 of Europe and the US, is, has to be set within a second equally important uh, disruption, a global age of disruption and turbulence, um, where you know, the whole sort of post-war liberal uh, world order you know, is, is obviously being challenged in some very, very profound ways. Um, and so, in a sense, you know, Britain's uh, disorder lives within this larger context of a global disorder. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's that uh, rudderlessness in that storm that we now face uh, that I want to talk about. And I think, you know, in a strange thing, Britons str struggle to get their heads around uh, issues of discontinuity and disruption. Uh, we are a society so rooted in our stability, in a way, and you know, speaking in a city like Oxford, uh, where just its very architecture uh, suggests that continuity, uh, not this building, but uh, uh, the city uh, as a whole. And, um, you know, such a sudden disruption, such a sudden break uh, with, with, with uh, the, the, the certainties of which those two anchors provided have, I think, you know, left us adrift in a very fundamental way. There is, and, and you know, in a sense, we, we, we fail to think through even how we might replace them because if you take the European uh, part of it, you know, this is, after all, a Europe which for centuries uh, 
uh, Britain has managed relationships with in order to try and secure a kind of balance of power or containment of disputes on the continent in a way that they would not affect or disrupt uh, British interests or global power. Uh, and, you know, that has been supplemented in the 20th century by that U.S. Uh, special relationship, which again has been so critical to every British diplomat's view of our place in the world. And, of course, there was a third leg until the middle of the 20th century, which was uh, the, that imperial link, if you like, and, you know, which, which har har ironically a Tory Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, did so much to apparently help Britain over the hump of uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the running down and closing out of that empire and of leading a Britain which seemed to sort of take it in its stride. And in a strange way, it, it's, I suspect, only all these decades later that uh, it, in some ways the sentiments that were locked up then have, have become really unleashed. Um, and so, you know, in, in, in this very strange place we now find ourselves, um, there is this peculiar effort, if I can put it that way, by um, uh, those who favor Brexit to reinvent that third leg, that frayed, long closed out imperial link through this romanticizing of something called global Britain. Uh, and you know, it's very striking every time the government has been pressed to put a little flesh on this concept, it's struggled to do so. Uh, I think there is, uh, probably in Oxford, there's always a trade economist who thinks differently to other trade economists, but, you know, in, in the hope that they're not in this room. Um, uh, let me just say that, you know, I, I find it very hard to find anyone who really thinks Britain alone negotiating trade deals uh, with third-party countries can possibly achieve the uh, advantages that it achieves as a member of, a Euro of the European trading bloc with all the uh, importance of scale and market share that it brings as leverage to the negotiating table. Um, similarly, uh, it's very hard to see Britain really sort of creating a separate security architecture of its own to replace uh, European institutions uh, like uh, Galileo. Um, and if you look beyond these short-term costs of how it manages uh, without its European, um, the, 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 these sort of European components to, its, to, to, to the structures and institutions of its foreign policy, you know, more broadly, of course, I think its difficulty is the perceived real meltdown in influence. I'm sure you all know from, you know, correspondence with friends and family abroad or uh, when you travel, the complete bewilderment with which uh, this choice that Britain has made of Brexit uh, is, is viewed. And that is a bewilderment which I'm afraid in many places is, is, is sinking uh, into, um, you know, maybe what follows disbelief uh, is forgetfulness. Um, I, one of my fellow Best for Britain board members, the economist Anatole Koletsky, uh, made a big tour of China just a few weeks ago talking to some 100 to 150 policymakers and business leaders. And he thought even more dangerous uh, than the reactions immediately after Brexit was it simply wasn't mentioned. Britain wasn't mentioned. There was curiosity in China about what was going to happen next in Italy. But, you know, Britain was in that sense already uh, dismissed as not relevant uh, in a central way to uh, China-Europe policy going forward. Uh, there are obviously consequences uh, to Britain's uh, multilateral uh, position. I, th I think, you know, I don't think Britain's about to lose, as some do, its UN Security Council seat. But that's not because anybody really believes it can sustain its claim to it um, post-Brexit, uh, but because, for other reasons, there's just no real momentum um, in the UN at the moment for opening up 
Security Council reform. Um, and so for reasons quite separate to Britain's standing, uh, we will probably keep that seat for now. But we need to understand that when the debate is opened, the single most vulnerable of the so-called P5, permanent five seats, uh, will be that of Britain. Uh, France will be able to position itself as the de facto European seat. Uh, Britain will have no such uh, larger constituency to claim uh, it represents. And we've seen, you know, this diminishing influence in things which Britain would never have lost in the past, like the vote for an ICJ judge, a very good British judge, even though he's a Cambridge man, not an Oxford one, um, uh, who, um, you know, didn't get the second term, which was almost a sort of nod through de facto expectation and was beaten out by an Indian with much less good international legal credentials in the eyes of many, uh, simply because uh, Britain no longer enjoyed the sort of solid support uh, that it had once had um, on these kinds of issues. Uh, a lot of smaller issues too where Europe is defecting as a block vote and there's simply no suggestion that, that, that the Commonwealth, for example, uh, as this government would like to think, is an alternative block vote to support British positions on issues. So when you combine all that with you know, a real loss of capacity to, to secure trade, um, you know, deals of any real significance, we have a very, very, very diminished Britain with one hand at least tied behind its back. And that goes to my second level of disorder, a, a Britain in a sense with a uh, reduced um, armory of, 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 of capacities in the diplomatic global arena facing increased uh, security issues. And, you know, I start with Russia. Um, you know, as someone who has dealt with Russians as a UN official all my career and have great respect and I would even like to think friendship for Lavrov, the, uh, the Russian foreign minister, I must say I was, I've been one of the slower to come to conclude that there really is, you know, a Russian move against the UK. But I have to say that while I suspect it doesn't reach to the level of, you know, Kremlin priority in terms of global foreign policy, I think a general strategy of disruption of Europe uh, finds a particular focus in what Kremlin analysts view as Europe's weakest link, and that is now the UK. Uh, and I think the events in Salisbury, the poisoning of uh, the Schripals, you know, very much reflected a judgment uh, that um, coming as it did just after Italian elections, that you now have uh, in Hungary, Greece and Italy three European countries which can no longer be counted on to back strong stands uh, uh, against uh, Russia. And I think you know, there's also the wider view that the European continental European energy dependence uh, on Russian gas always means that there has to be a much higher level of collaboration uh, than, than, than a Britain post Salisbury would ever be comfortable with. And a view that uh, reflected in Trump's call for Russia to be allowed back into the G7 uh, just last weekend, that whatever the initial willingness of some in the US administration to show solidarity as Europe itself too did after uh, the Salisbury poisonings, that in the longer term, other countries have had got to make their accommodation uh, with Russia and that in a very real way uh, Britain is going to be significantly exposed and isolated over time and that in that way Russia can play a rather longer game and I anticipate we will see more not necessarily of incidents like, like Salisbury but of continued pressure on Britain by Russia uh, as, as I say the, 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 the weak link. And Britain for itself, you know, very likely not able to deal with uh, European issues that in a way it's been able to hide behind the broader uh, European solidarity on. And, and, you know, the issue, ironically, which probably that is most true about is immigration. Um, an issue which in Brexit terms seemed to be an issue about, you know, fellow Europeans coming here uh, and contributing hugely to the employment uh, in our economy, as you would expect of the fastest growing economy in Europe, that it would suck in 
employment, both skilled and unskilled, from other parts of, 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 of Europe. But of course, it's the wider immigration crisis of uh, an increasingly unequal economic opportunity in the world, uh, of political instability in regions from Central Asia and Afghanistan uh, and South Asia at one end, uh, all the way through to North and West Africa uh, and the Middle East at the other. And you know, while Europe has served as a buffer for Britain uh, for much of that, I expect Britain is going to find itself much more exposed to direct immigration management of the kind that you know, has been so difficult for Italy and other uh, current frontline states in, in, in terms of immigration pressures. And when it comes to dealing with other sort of just outside our region issues, the new global Britain, to the extent you can attach any uh, characteristic at all to it, seems to be a mercantilist uh, strategy in the sense that uh, the old British attention to, 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 to sort of, if you like, a, a ethical foreign policy, to use the term of the early Blair years, has been replaced by a willingness to sort of flog arms to regimes in the Middle East and elsewhere uh, in order to sort of bump up uh, the alternative sales uh, export numbers to replace uh, you know, lost potential of lost uh, European trade. So in a very real way, we find ourselves likely to migrate from the sort of soft power liberal values for which, you know, someone like myself, uh, you know, admired uh, my country uh, so much for. And, um, you know, in this, the challenge is where is the reset? And uh, does it matter that we're, in a sense, driving in a more a nationalist, almost Britain first way? Uh, and, you know, I, I think the fact is there's, there's certainly plenty of other leaders out there who are moving in the direction so exemplified uh, by Donald Trump. I mean, you know, I think sometimes, as Nari observed that I'd worked very hard on governance and democracy when I was at UNDP. When I left UNDP uh, in, in 2005, you know, we had reached a high watermark of democracies around the world. Some 130 countries were, according to Freedom House, uh, broadly uh, democratic, so rather over two-thirds um, of, of, of the members of the UN. You know, today, the numbers have come down, not so dramatically in terms of headline, but from fully, you know, the way Freedom House ranks countries, the fully democratic have become in many cases only partially democratic, and the partially democratic have slipped a column as well. But most critically, a handful of very large countries in the world have moved into the authoritarian uh, category. So you've got what I think of as the rise of the Caesars. Um, some were already there, President Xi in China, but uh, whether it is Putin in Russia or Erdogan in Turkey or Sisi in Egypt, or obviously Trump himself in the United States, it's a very clear direction of travel. Um, but as my wife likes to say, it's also supported by the little Caesars. I think she spent too much, we'd, we'd ordered too many pizzas for the family because you know, you've got the Orban and the Dutertes um, and you know, the new Italian government, Conti and others. Uh, there is a clear direction here uh, in terms of a more authoritarian, country-first uh, model of government with a much more transactional, bilateralized uh, approach uh, to, to foreign policy. And, you know, I suppose Britain could join the column. Uh, but, of course, one would like to see a Britain uh, which led the countercharge, which, you know, put a premium on those values of openness and soft values, uh, which have served it so well uh, in the decades uh, of the latter to late 20th century and early 21st century. You know, it was these that allowed us past that burden and history of empire, if you like, to become a highly regarded um, Sweden-like country, if you like, uh, a champion of international human rights, one of the few countries meeting the 0.7% target of GDP spent on development assistance. And, you know, that 
that whole sort of national personality is endangered uh, by the rush to maximize trade and, and deal with this very changed world, minus the anchors I described at the beginning. And, you know, in it, we therefore just come to, to, to the challenge of where does Britain go in this, this context? And, um, you know, we, we know we still have these huge uh, reservoir of, of, of assets that we still have probably the most skilled diplomats in the world, that we have extraordinary, unique instruments of soft power like the BBC, like DFID, our Department of International Development, or the British Council, um, that we are a huge voice still on, at least at the non-governmental level, on issues such as international human rights or, 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 or climate change. Uh, that we have still a leading, if diminished, uh, military capacity in the world, and that those values which um, have underpinned our soft power, and, and I hardly dare speak to this issue with Joe Nye in the room, but, uh, um, um, you know, remain at this point still relatively uh, intact of, you know, a, an evident commitment as a country to the rule of law, to human rights, to democracy promotion, etc. And I think, you know, one option going forward is that these could be fashioned into a typical liberal small country capacity. I mean, the Norway, Norway, Switzerland, Singapore model, although Singapore doesn't conform with all of that. Um, and the question is, can we still add to that a, a big power ambition? Uh, when I heard Theresa May give her sp first speak at the General Assembly, having become Prime Minister, you know, she admirably majored on, on, on child slavery issues around the world. You could close your eyes and think it was the Prime Minister of Norway talking. So um, when people talk about a Norway solution in terms of an economic free trade agreement, I always think of a Norway solution rather differently as, you know, um, a NGO posing as a country kind of um, uh, uh, model. And, you know, I think that that is a perfectly plausible op op option for us, I suppose. But pushing against it, is this global Britain desire to find new trading um, opportunities to replace the potential lost trade uh, from diminished sales and to, to the EU from the frictions of the new border relations, whatever they end up. And pushing against it too uh, is that we are a country which has extraordinarily high standards around you know, food and drug administration, regulation in those areas. And so, you know, there's a real risk that, you know, a combination of, 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 of selling guns to the Saudis and buying chlorinated chicken from the U.S. becomes, you know, and this is not, this is a, not a remark which should not be delivered. It is not worthy of a lectern in Oxford, but it becomes our new kind of guns and butter strategy or guns and chicken. Um, and, you know, I, I just think, you know, we've really got to understand where we're going in this, uh, you know, post-Europe world that we've, we've appeared to have chosen for ourselves. And, you know, I think we also have to understand that with the sort of small country going it alone uh, comes a small country's vulnerabilities. I've already mentioned the way I think Russia is targeting us as, if you like, the weak chink uh, in Europe. Um, but, you know, the very institutions where we will still enjoy some kind of residual uh, status from our history of NATO, uh, the UN, Bretton Woods, and indeed particularly the Commonwealth, you know, are the very institutions which are not going to do very well in this highly transactionalized, bilateralized, country first model of, of, of international and foreign policy. Um, you know, it's fine for a President Trump uh, leading a country with the economic and security clout of America to have an America first policy. But, you know, small country after small country, the Swedens, but even much larger uh, countries around the world who don't make that first league in terms of size and clout always find themselves driven back to the UN because they need a world first policy rather than 
a country first policy because it's only through that collaboration uh, that they can both secure their own security uh, but also prosperity and access to a world governed by the rule of law. And so perversely, uh, by choosing to leave our most immediate multilateral organization, the EU, we're going to make ourselves even more dependent on our historic but hard to sustain long-term position uh, in these other uh, institutions of the multilateral system. And so it won't surprise you that in a sense, though it's late in the day, I believe really the only way to get British foreign policy back, if you like, into engagement uh, and effectiveness uh, is to win the fight back here to reverse the leaving of the EU. And I say that not just because I think it gives us back the size and clout to operate on the world stage. I say it because Europe itself needs us as much as we need Europe. The crisis I referred to, which has produced you know, produce the kinds of governments we see now in Italy, uh, the political crisis across the whole southern Mediterranean front of, 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 of Europe, uh, the profound malaise uh, in even the northern European countries, uh, the chronic ineffectiveness of Brussels as an administrative uh, center for Europe. You know, all these issues are not issues to run away from. If Britain has any history at all, it's about engaging in them and helping lead uh, the search for solutions uh, for, for, for these issues. And so, you know, I feel very, very strongly like, um, in a sense, you know, much more, I mean, national leaders of great uh, significance have felt over the centuries that, you know, however reluctant British politicians at Westminster are to engage in Europe, however frequent the knee-jerk reaction over the centuries has been to sort of, you know, pull up, let's pull up the map of Europe and, and, and try and either focus on British imperial possessions elsewhere in the past or now uh, this sort of global Britain uh, repackaging of that idea. In truth, we always get driven back to Europe. We simply cannot afford as a country to see Europe go wrong. Uh, that channel isn't wide enough uh, to allow us to do uh, anything else. But I think there is something else that has to be said, which is, you know, as someone whose life has been spent in a combination of development and foreign policy, I think I'd sort of live the sort of connection between them both. And my view is foreign policy only works when it is a projection of the values and priorities and things that drive politics back home. You know, and when foreign policy gets into trouble, it's when it's left to uh, what the Brexiteers would call an elite uh, in, in, in the Foreign Office or in the American State Department or wherever it is, who pursue an agenda that has become detached and disconnected uh, from ordinary people's feelings. And, you know, the extraordinary thing about the age of social media into which we have moved uh, and about the sort of shrinking of the world through not just technology, but uh, through all sorts of integration of, 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 of global trade and uh, global societies in different ways, is that for the first time ever, there is real opportunity for real alignment between uh, what we as believe as individuals and communities uh, and what we do in our lives around issues like climate change and the environment or you know our views of food chain and supplies or our standards about uh, child slavery and and indeed employment rights around the world and a foreign policy that reflects this we've reached a moment where there is no excuse for not having a highly demo democratized foreign policy that is reflective of our priorities as, as, as citizens. And yet, when you look at things, you know, for example, the annual Edelman Trust Barometer and similar work done by Gallup and others, we see the trust in institutions is at a very, very low ebb. Uh, and that really the most trusted people, strangely, this last year in the Edelman Trust Barometer, journalists got a 
pip up, not because they were doing better, but everybody else was doing worse, I think. Uh, but the bit that, you know, the, the, the source of trust for most people is people like me, uh, not me, but people like ourselves. In other words, we find in the fight around Brexit that if health workers talk to health workers about the difficulties of a health service where there aren't sufficient nurses and doctors coming on board, that is much more persuasive than a report delivered from a podium uh, somewhere in, 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 in SW1. And so, you know, this again, this sort of democratization of the discussion about the country's priorities should extend into its foreign policy. And so, you know, my vision of Britain going forward, and indeed of Europe going forward, is not that we're trying to return to the status quo ante uh, of, of pre-Brexit. Brexit was a profound point in Britain's life to which there is, you know, it's not a nightmare which we wake up from. Uh, it reflected real problems in our domestic politics, real inequalities and angers which need to be responded to. I happen to be one of those who believe that Brexit isn't the right answer to the question, uh, that you know, a more equal Britain can be fashioned within Europe. But I think what it also told us was that we've got to get on with that job of fashioning a Europe which is more democratic and accountable, and which and for this, there is a massive majority across the civil society of Europe as much as here. A Europe in the middle of this world of Caesars with rising Asian Caesars on one side and a Trump America on the other. A Europe which in a very real, profound, bottom-up way uh, reflects the values of Britain and Europe civil society at its best, a real care and attention uh, to the quality of the lives of our people, a focus on climate change, a focus on the rights of people around the world, a real attention to the immigrant producing regions of the world, to try and work with them to find development solutions that allow uh, human movement to be better managed and, and, and the tragedies of recent years avoided. And that kind of global conversation and that global collaboration and multilateral search for solutions has become an orphan in today's world. And Britain leaving Europe is not going to help that. Britain coming back to Europe and offering leadership on that kind of progressive agenda, I think, offers not just the world a kind of European platform between these increasingly two competitive halves of East and West, uh, but also offers for all of us the chance of a kind of renewed politics at home as much as abroad. Thank you very much. Great. Well, over to you for questions and comments now. So... Uh, Mark has kindly agreed to take questions and comments. Who would like to kick off? Yes, at the back. And do introduce yourself. Hi, um, just first, just, um, Jenny Jackson, um, full-time mother in Oxford. Um, you talked of a um, sort of uh, renewal in the EU. And do you think, um, if that were the case when David Cameron went to the EU and asked for concessions that he was asking for, with a, a threat of Brexit on the horizon, in that renewed EU, would he have got those concessions? Because my concern is that those in Europe put the project EU above practicalities and that the good things are dissipating because they're being a bit brittle about things. Yes, Mark, you said um, Britain should use the European platform, but some might say that that platform's burning. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Do you want me to take those? I mean, look, Jenny, I think it's a, it's a very good point. I, I think that there is a lot of remorse in Europe that, in a sense, uh, Cameron was not given a better offer to bring back to the British people. I, I think, in a sense, he brought it on himself. I mean, I think Nari as well, you would occasionally go and see him, as I did, shortly after he became prime minister, and there was already this distaste for multilateral meetings and impatience about all those European leaders or the G7 leaders and, you know, the, these, these sort of 
that Tory team, while much more liberal and enlightened than what's come since, was a curiously insular team. I, I was always in my own mind comparing it to the Labour cabinet table I had sat around where, you know, probably half the cabinet had one way or another, you know, done academic spells or graduate studies in, in Northern Europe or somewhere in, I mean, in, in North America or somewhere in Europe. And, you know, the Cameron team was very, very homegrown. And in that sense, I felt poorly attuned to, to sort of understanding international negotiations. And you have to remember that even before he became prime minister, he'd caused huge offense in Europe by leading, leaving the main right of center grouping and moving to this hard right group. And so, you know, he was somebody with actually very little capital in, in, in Europe in terms of the leaders. But I think the other, you know, bad luck for him was, and for us, was that, you know, the, the, he, he came too soon in terms of Europe's own cons debate about migration, you know. Um, and, you know, talking to prominent Dutch and Swedes and others, you know, I think he would have had a much more sympathetic uh, support he also, strangely, didn't even take advantage of what you can do under existing EU rules in terms of, of migration management. So I think it was a very lazy, casual effort, both in the negotiation by both sides, but at least by Cameron as much as the European side, and then in the campaign itself to really address the vulnerability at the heart of that campaign, which evidently was the migration issue. But I think to Nari's point about the burning platform, absolutely. I mean, I, as I say, my case for us going back to Europe is not just, oh, you know, we need those trading rights back. It's Europe's burning. And when Europe burns, Britain has a history of having to get stuck in to solve it. And, you know, in that way, you know, I think one way or another, even if Brexit happened, the likelihood that we could see the continued sort of burning of Europe's institutions that we are currently seeing and, and remain sort of locked away from it is highly implausible. So, you know, to give up our main lever, being a leading voice in the EU, to work with Europeans to address the crisis of Europe, I, I, I think is a huge mistake. But can I push you just one, mm. one further on that? Because... <coughs> Europe is no longer, no longer has the political unity it once had. It's the, the financial crisis divided it into credit, creditors and debtors. The immigration crisis and recent elections have divided it. There is no longer a European set of values that we can honestly say Europe, unify Hungary, Poland, Austria, France, Germany, and Italy, I would say, that on really fundamental... And then add to that the fact that Europe is now at least 80% dependent on large American technology companies on which the future of most businesses depend. Britain has held on to a foot in the financial services camp, but you know, conversations with bankers looking at the effects of recent US policies on European banks' ability to play in the dollar market means that's going too. Yeah. I mean, is Europe actually lost anyway? I mean, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate no, no. as you say, no, are you mourning to be part of a European Union that's no longer there? And actually, all of us will have to choose in all of these decisions between either being dependent upon China or dependent upon the United States. Well, you know, look, it's an extremely good point, And it's why I say that there's no, we're not going back to some you know, sort of repainted Brussels hostelry of the past. I mean, you know, that, that Europe is gone. You know, I think, you know, Brussels, uh, you know, I mean, I think we're going to see profound fundamental change in Europe around both, you know, a complete revamping of the governance of the EU, but behind that even more profoundly, you know, the, the sort of opting out of different parts of Europe from different areas of collaboration of which Hungary and migration and now Austria and some others are probably the most visible uh, bit at the moment. We're going to see massive tension in terms of how to deal with Russia, with 
you know, Italy and Southern Europe, in some ways, in that sense, um, you know, de 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 defecting in, in a sense from what has been the European position till now. But I would pose to you that is the option, therefore, as you've just said it, to, in a sense, give up on the European project altogether and just decide which side you're joining, China or, or North America, or, as I implied or said, I mean, you know, I think there is a chance of moving to a three-block world and by being part of that European third block, and this is crudely put because it's more than three blocks, but nevertheless, you know, by being uh, the, the, the sort of doorstop between East and West, to be a source of values, stability, to be the balance between two regions which I think are inevitably going to find themselves in a degree of economic and occasionally security competition and confrontation. You know, I think Europe is going to be much better served by fashioning its own, if very different, kind of unity in the midst of that so it can kind of manage uh, to be the sort of balance in the middle between those two than descending into a bunch of enfeebled, weak individual nation states just finding, cutting whatever economic deal they can uh, with whoever will offer it to them. But as I say, so for me, it's not returning to the glory days of a Europe of the past. It's being there on the ground floor to refashion a Europe for this f profoundly changed world that we now are, are living in. Thank you. I'll take more questions, but I, I am going to call on Professor Joseph Nye, who uh, we're thrilled to have with us, a visiting professor in the Blavatnik School, um, the author, of course, of the idea of soft power and smart power. Um, Mark has put two propositions to us. One is the three-block world. Do you think there's going to be a three-block world, or is it going to be a two-block world? And second, is the time of soft power over? You've written about soft power and smart power. Mark... Mark's wish is that Britain would play the soft power role within Europe and Europe in the world. But is that era over? Well, thank you. Uh, I largely agree with what Mark said, so I can't <laughs> be a foil for him. But uh, I, I think uh, Britain has a good deal of soft power. Uh, if you take something like this Portland uh, index of the soft power 30, uh, Britain was in top position a few years ago and, and is always in the top few. So it has assets, of, with many of which you enumerated. And if you're living in an information age, um, the ability, if you think of soft power as the ability to attract, I think you're going to find more and more uh, <coughs> relevance of soft power. So I think, uh, uh, you know, the Norway model, you know, five million people who's not Britain, but, but Norway has been able to have more influence on more things because of uh, more issues because of, uh, of its soft power, which goes back to the nature of its society, the, the way it treats women, its, uh, its foreign aid program, its casting itself as a, uh, as a mediator on many issues of peace. So, so I don't think, I think Britain actually can use soft power. But I would argue that, uh, uh, since I agree with Mark, uh, it, 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 I mean, it'd be nice to imagine that uh, you had a parliamentary vote which led to another referendum and everything went back. But I, let's suppose that that's not the world. I think Britain can still follow an a aspect of the grand strategy it had successfully since the 70s, which is Britain was able to enhance its own power by leveraging Europe and by leveraging the United States. And it wasn't a bridge. You don't need a bridge. It was able to enhance Britain's influence by pulling on its capacity in both directions. And to some extent, you don't need the formal institutions for that. You need the attitude of how you want to do it. And in that sense, if, 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 if I go to the title, uh, how do you salvage foreign policy, ideally, I would agree with you, I'd like to say, uh, let's have parliament return parliamentary sovereignty to where it belongs, and let's have a new vote, which we could probably have 2% of the people who've changed their mind by then. 
but I'm told by friends that that may be wishful thinking. If it isn't, I think you can still use Britain's soft and hard power to leverage both of those directions. I mean, Britain is one of the few countries with an, a real expeditionary military capability still remaining, which means that if you go back to Britain and Sierra Leone and what an important role Britain played there, just as a, a for instance, Britain still is important, as the French were in Mali and so forth. And in terms of soft power, many of those assets you described allow Britain to have leverage inside the United States in the in what you might call the permanent government in the Congress and so forth. So I would say if you can't get the vote redone, I think still you had the right grand strategy and you got to figure out then how do you do it without the formal institutionalization. Uh, Norway has. Now you wind up paying the dues and not getting the vote, but nonetheless you can have a fair degree of influence and a serious strategy. Anyway, that's, that's my two bits worth. Mike, do you want to reflect on, you've been a British Foreign Minister. Um, does that sound possible? Uh, well, I, I mean, I hope it's possible. Um, um, and, you know, I just make several cautionary caveats because, um, you know, I, I, while it is the case that Britain can still project an exped expeditionary force, you know, I, I think in truth, uh, if you look at recent British versus French performance in the UN in terms of securing support for their different sort of African operations, you know, the French were ahead on points, you know, despite the fact that Mali is hugely difficult. The UN is, you know, more willing to back Mali in some ways than Somalia, where the British have taken the lead. And I, just, I think that's sort of, you know, ju that's just going to be the case now that, you know. And secondly, I, I, I think that particularly France, you know, while I think generous in trying to hold open the door for Britain's return, once we go, I cannot see President Macron allowing Britain to, you know, still be, you know, the interpreter of Europe to Washington and, 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 and vice versa. And I would just say, Joe, as you raised it, um, you know, your friends are, are right. It's a long shot to reverse this thing. I don't disagree with that. But, you know, a lot of us have been fought very hard for this so-called meaningful vote, which we just about, just about saved last night in some form or other, um, which will prevent the Prime Minister, and she's acknowledged as much today, you know, presenting a deal to Parliament which just says it's my deal or no deal. Um, and therefore, the road will be open to, you know, potentially a second referendum, a so-called people's vote, because people having had one referendum, you know, are exhausted and horrified at the prospect of rows at family dinner tables about another. Um, but, you know, I, I think there is a, in the polling, a growing acceptance that there's been so much confusion about this process, so much clarity, lack of clarity about what the offer is going to be, uh, and therefore such a loss of faith, not just in the government, but in Parliament, uh, that I think there actually will be a reluctant appetite to take the deal back to the people. Uh, it's by no means certain, but I think there's probably about a 30% chance that will happen, and I think it's worth fighting for. Questions. I'm going to take a handful of questions together so we can get some thoughts. So, Calypso, do introduce yourself briefly. Yeah. Hello, Calypso Nicolaitis. Um, it's inspiring to hear you because at the end of the day, there is a vision of foreign policy for the UK, even with Brexit. And the question becomes, or what I'm worried about, is whether you think the EU itself, Brussels, but also Macron and the leaders we still have in the EU, are playing ball with a vision whereby we stay as close as possible. Isn't it the case that from Paris, what we hear is a Macron who tells us, hey, I want your Chinook for, to help me in Mali, but give me your banks too uh, to come to Paris. Um, in other words, a, a sense that you know, it is the EU that is playing cakeism, and it is the EU that is also uh, trying to, 
um, get what it can in, with, through the, what it can still get in terms of the, the, the soft power and the hard power of the UK, but without making concessions on other fronts. So how can we address this problem on the Brussels side? Thank you. Do you want to pass the microphone forward? There was a, was it, oh. Hello, thank you very much. My name is David. I'm studying uh, diplomacy here at the university. I just have a question regarding your final remarks regarding uh, vision for UK and you going forward. So you stated that Europe, which so you, you see Europe, which reflects the values of the people, is more inclusive and provides more equality. At the same time, uh, Europe must become more efficient in foreign policy. And there are some suggestions on the table by Mr. Macron and Mr. Mer Merkel, uh, who see a more central foreign policy of European Union, which will make the democratic deficit even worse. So any practical solutions, I mean, yeah, the aim is clear to make it more inclusive, but how to achieve it? Yeah. There's gonna, kind of contradicting targets. I'm going to keep taking a couple of questions so we can really hear from some of you because I can see we're up against the clock. Yes, here. Uh, my name is Michael Payne. Uh, I'm a, a lawyer. Thank you very much for your lecture, which didn't depress me quite as much as I thought it might. <laughs> Have you got a view on this? Might the non-reversal of Brexit threaten the integrity of the UK, and what then for our leverage and role in the world? Great, and then right at the back, there's a gentleman. Thank you, Sam Bruce, I'm a graduate student in politics here in Oxford. Um, and I had a very similar question, um, could there be a tension if, if promoting openness and democracy in the world can only be done best by Britain by a reversal of Brexit, is there a danger that if, if that appears to be or is um, a very top-down rather than bottom-up reversal, might that undermine the ability and credibility that Britain has to, um, uh, to promote the values of openness and democracy? And if so, are there ways of ensuring that that's more bottom-up? You mentioned social media, but does social media give enough space for the kinds of uh, deep and intense discussion that would be needed to bring about such a bottom-up reversal of Brexit. Thank, Thank you. you. And then over here, this lady here. Hello, Roseanne Bostock, and I live in Oxford. Uh, yes, it's, it's much the same about the, que the question of whether there's any movement in the actual EU. I mean, it seems to me half this country is racking its brains what we can do. And is the, I don't think there's much sign, certainly in the papers, of there being any change in the EU. That's what bothers me. Very good. And one further one down here. Yeah, I have a, a common stroke question, which relates quite, quite a lot to the previous, um, particularly the penultimate one. And it's about... Um, needing some kind of bottom-up movement from the people if, if things are ch to change. And it's something that I'm very conscious of, that um, even in this room, a lot of the people are sort of more my age than, you know, my children's age. Mm -hmm. And although, uh, uh, according to the polls, a lot of young people were in favour of, uh, were not in favour of Brexit, I see, I don't see masses of young people on the streets and, it's this, and is this because there's been a lack of education about Europe over the years or what? But how, there's, there's things happening in Parliament, but there's not enough happening on the streets and on the ground. And the organisations such as yours, um, for a start, there seems to be, they don't seem to be one organisation. It seems to be very split or has been. And there's not this mass move, movement, even if I think of something like the peace movement in the 80s, there was, there was something else and that hasn't really come up, come up, to my mind, with Brexit at that level. And that concerns me. Thank you. So let's take Britain. those. First to Britain, what's the average yeah, I'm, age? I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> well, I'm going, to start, I'm going to start that last yeah. question and work back, because I think it, you know, in a way, summarizes a lot of what, what was said before. Um, you know, it, it, I, I spoke to a great friend who, who, who was foreign minister of Norway, and he made two points to me. You know, one was... You know, because we're a country of five million people and we've had centuries of being bullied by the Swedes and the Russians, uh, we'll, take what, we'll do what Europe tells us to do, um, but Britain never will. So this idea of, 
you know, vassal state status, rule taker, not rule maker, is just a fundamentally un, un, un uh, stable uh, way of, 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 you know, living going forward. But the much more important, you know, point that he made, and which the Swiss have made to me as well, is, you know, that they both in their ways had very tight referenda where youngsters voted in favor of being in Europe. But in the years since, far from that turning into a majority demographic in favor of being in Europe, this sense of resentment of being a rule taker, not a rule maker, as in both countries built up very large anti-EU majorities. So, you know, so that, that's the longer term observation, that it's not just a matter of sitting and waiting till the demography favors. So it comes to the point you've said so, which is completely right. I mean, you know, it simply isn't imaginable at this stage that we're going to have a summer of, you know, our own 1968 with everybody wanting to go back to Brussels and uh, um, uh, join these Monsieur Barnier and the rest. I mean, these are not individuals or an institution uh, which gets young people's heart rates up. Uh, and, you know, there is, uh, and this is a slightly kind of, I'm, I'll get in trouble for saying this, but I, I'm, there's a, a very large march being planned for the anniversary, June the 23rd. You know, I will be, in, and I really want it to succeed, and we're doing all we can to make it succeed. I wouldn't be at all surprised if a few weeks later, a spontaneous demonstration against Donald Trump's big visit isn't bigger. And what I keep on telling my campaign team is, the only arguments that move opinion on Brexit don't have the word Brexit in them. Um, because it is this complete turnoff. The arguments that people are moved by is arguments about their prosperity, their security, their jobs, their security, etc., etc. And so we have to find a case which isn't this elite re boot or of, of, of the first referendum about Brexit. It's about a country which recognizes it's gotten itself adrift because it didn't address domestic problems. It led to a vote which, far from solving those problems, is likely, if allowed to stand, to worsen those problems. And how can we come together in a progressive way to handle our real issues? And we've got to do that because otherwise, as I think Joe implied, you know, we could rerun the referendum, and this time probably our lot would get 52, and the other side would get 48. But that won't end it. You know, it'll just continue the uncertainty. And so, as a campaigning organization, we made a proposal. I sort of wrote an open letter to the British people. You wouldn't have seen it. But, um, but basically what I said was, and published it last Friday, saying, look, you know, uncertainty has become the great enemy now. It's a bigger risk to Britain's prosperity and security, even maybe than Brexit itself. So why can't we all agree a process to end this one way or another by March of next year? Because on the current rate, this is going to go on for years. Because if we stick with the plans to leave, it will be years of negotiation, years before this government even gets sufficient internal consistency to seriously engage with Brussels. You know, we'll go into the transition with just some aspirational headlines for the negotiations. So I said, let's give the Prime Minister the mandate, let's send her off to Brussels, let her come back with her best terms, put it to Parliament and the people, run a second vote on it, people's vote, and then let's all agree to live by the result, in or out. Because, you know, I think only something like that, with a time limit on it, will re-motivate very bored people, fatigued people, to one more time get engaged and sort this. Because I do think people are worried by the prolonged uncertainty and the lack of clarity about what it is we voted for. So I think that that is very important that we, 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 we do it. But as I say, I, I think the argument will ultimately be much more around the issue of the impact of Trump on our security than it will be uh, the appeal of Mr. Juncker to have us back, you know, at his table. So we, we've just got to recognize that. And it comes, therefore, to the top down versus bottom up. I hate this breach of parliamentary democracy. I hate the fact that we've gone down this road of referenda about highly complex issues which cannot be reduced to yes, no questions. But we have. And I don't think we can reverse our way out of it 
without a second referendum, because I think any decision by Parliament to thwart the will of the people would be seen uh, as, um, you know, as, as a breach, if you like, of that original choice people, people made. To the sovereignty of the UK, I think it's at real risk. I mean, you know, it is extraordinary that a party, the Conservative Party, which, you know, throughout its history has been devoted to the idea of the security, security of the Union may become the agent's agent of its dismantling. I mean, I keep very close to the Irish issue. You know, Irish politics are changing in a profound way, which is not recognizable at Westminster because the DUP really doesn't speak for Northern Ireland at this point. You know, so if there is a border there, it is going to have an electrifying effect on, on, on uh, the politics of Ireland and a move towards a more a united Ireland. I think the Scotland issue, if that was to happen, is currently only on hold and, you know, would very likely raise its head again around a movement for Scottish independence. And so within Europe, um, and while at the moment, you know, Europe has given no inch on that, I think post Brexit post the completion of the process, uh, they would look at that perhaps very differently. So, um, you know, I, I, I think we are in a very dangerous space, and hence to this point about, which was asked by several of you about the Europeans. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you've got to divide this into several layers of Europeans. I actually think that at the level of Macron and Merkel and their counterparts in the Netherlands or uh, the Nordics, you know, they are actually being pretty magnanimous about this. And they are very, very aware that anything they say will be used in the Daily Mail against them. Um, and, you know, they are very cautious of saying anything that could be taken as an intervention in the British political debate. Um, I think a step or two beneath them, there is more mischief going on. The mayor of Paris and the boosters of Paris, of course, want to get the financial sector from London to Paris, you know, and in a way that competition between cities is, is a healthy one. It's a more dynamic one in many ways than competition between countries today. And I don't think there's any way that you can prevent that. And similarly, you've got these sort of dirigist, rather dour-faced European officials dealing with the Galileo security system and some other things where, you know, I, 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 th I think they are behaving like Brussels bureaucrats of the kind which, you know, have offended Britons for, for a long time and, you know, are, are, are not at all helpful uh, to the debate back here in the UK. You know, but, but ultimately, and one of you put your finger on it, you know, there are, you know, middle level officials in governments and institutions like Brussels all over the world and you know they often have a politically deaf ear and a, you know look at the letter of the rules rather than the spirit of them but the real crime is generation after generation of British politicians for whom the default blame for anything that goes wrong is Europe you know we have had f decades of denigration of Europe by both parties you know, and we've now inherited that. It prevented David Cameron running a positive campaign for Europe. Even today, it inhibits me from actually talking as much as I'd like to, other than to an audience like this, about the reform of Europe. Because, you know, you've got this Brexit debate has become all work played out in the teacup of Britain. It's not. It, this is a debate about Europe and its future. And, you know, the fact that one has to be constrained in acknowledging that is a terrible commentary on the consistent betrayal of the sort of issue by British politicians of all parties over a very long time. Mark, one of the, the, the other question that was asked was about European foreign policy. Surely... Yeah. The row over sanctions on Iran and the tearing up of the agreement with Iran is proof that Europe can't do it, that every British company, every European company is saying they cannot risk continuing to do any business with Iran because of the U.S. sanctions regime. And I just, I just wonder, I mean, it's back to the third block. You know, yeah. 
Is it really a third block or is that just a dream in all of our heads that we're part of this third block? Well, I think it's a very, very good point. And I think, you know, I, I, I mean, the Russians and the Chinese have periodically talked about creating uh, international uh, financial flow systems which are, you know, outside the control of the American banking system, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, you can see some indications of that. I think you can't use MasterCard in Russia anymore. I mean, you know, there is already some sort of autarky developing in, in, in the international, um, you know, banking system around the reluctance of China and Russia to put themselves automatically, you know, on the losing side of, of, of American sanctions regimes. And I think that, you know, Iran is hardly the most popular cause on which to, to, to rally this issue. But I think you are going to see the beginnings of similar moves in Europe to separate out uh, the, the, you know, European sort of the European banking system from this wholehearted dependence on, on uh, you know, the, the, the reach of American extraterritoriality. <coughs> Uh, when it comes to sanctions. And it's a tragedy because, you know, for me on the UN side, when you had an America on the side of multilateralism and the rule of law, finally you were getting sanctions which were working. You know, uh, I mean, you know, sanctions is part of what got North Korea to the table now. It was sanctions that got Iran to the table in terms of the you know, agreement that is now uh, so at risk. And that was after several decades in which sanctions looked like the ultimate toothless tiger. They never seemed to work. And it was, you know, officials in the U.S. Treasury who've really given sanctions teeth. But when you then separate that from rule of law and multilateral sanctions agreements, you very rapidly re remove the legitimacy and, and confidence in such systems. So I, you know, I fear that you know, you're right. In the short term, Iran is going to lose over this, or at least European countries trying to work in Iran. In the longer term, I think it will fuel uh, a move to in some ways separate out from the US in terms of financial system. Mm -hmm. We've got time for a couple more questions. Yeah, yes. Um, I'm appalled that you think the solution is going to come with having another referendum. <laughs> referendums, referendums are fine if you're, like Switzerland, voting on should women have the vote or some simple thing like that. But we saw from, <laughs> we saw from our referendum that people vote on very different things. To one person, what's important is the Irish border. To other people, it's um, immigration. Other, it's, other thing is the state of the farming industry or something like that. You can't have a referendum. It, it, it results in nearly, nearly half the people being dissatisfied. And isn't it, isn't it the case that actually referendums are mainly a plebiscite about whether people like the government of the day or not. And the government was always going to lose the referendum. If they'd asked the question the opposite way, Brits would have probably voted in droves to remain, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's, isn't that why the Brexiteers know that they must stop another referendum because people will vote against the government? Well, look, Lady Bullard, it is a, um, it's a very good question. And, you know, I, as, as I hope I made clear, you know, I, I come at it as, you know, not someone at all convinced of the virtue of referenda. I think the first one was a disaster. I completely agree with you um, for all the reasons you've said and, and, and Nari has added to. But I just simply don't see a way of reversing the decision of the people except via a second one. I simply do not think we have a parliament that has the courage to take back the decision from the people. And you kind of count up the numbers and, you know, the great majority, you know, the, today's parliament, two thirds of them, you know, were declared remainers at the time of the referendum. Today, there are only a very small handful who are explicit Remainers. You know, this great movement of, of, of opponents to the government hide under the banner of, well, we want a soft Brexit. You know, we want, you know, as much integration as possible, but they're trying to, at the moment, square a circle between knowing that Brexit would be an economic disaster, but not wanting to thwart the will of the people. 
So, you know, as declared in the referendum. So literally, the only way out of this ridiculous constitutional cul-de-sac we've got ourselves into, I fear, is a second vote. Now, how can we make sure that this second vote is different to the first one? And I think there's a high road and a low road. The high road is that last time it was a simple e question on a proposition which got completely subordinated to a furious, I mean, this vote wasn't anti-Brussels, it was anti-London. <laughs> It was a vote against an establishment that was seen as having failed people on all kinds of issues. Um, we have to make sure that the second vote both respects that and says London's heard. And, you know, politicians are keen to get back to a discussion of the real issues that prompted that howl of protest in that vote. But secondly, look, can we please look at the terms? Can we actually see you know, what we have now and what we would have under Brexit and engage in a much more rational debate about that scorecard, if you like? And we've given a lot of thought to how could we do that. And the idea that think tanks in London or governments or oppositions would be trusted on that is not true. We're going to have to find people's organizations in some kind of national, national dialogue or conversation where people talk to people about what it's going to mean for the health service or education or jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Because unless there's that kind of dialogue, we're not going to get trust in the answers we, we, we are given. So that, if you like, is the high road. The low road is, um, is, is that, you know, as Nari has just implied, the Brexiteers were the sort of voice of an angry people who were voting against the establishment and the status quo. Today, the Brexiteers are the establishment. They are in government. They are the ones who've twisted and turned and done nothing for two years. And so in that sense, I think it is possible to harness you know, a, a level of anger and energy behind this that wasn't possible when it was David Cameron and the men in suits who were the voice of this, I think it is possible to offer a much more pros you know, progressive sort of anti-establishment case for staying in Europe than we were able to do, in, or the people who did it were able to do two years ago. Just out of interest, how many people in this room would like to see a second referendum? Any takers? <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay, well, I'm afraid, Lady Bullard, you have you're, not you're persuaded out, them. Out <laughs> um, Rarely, but on this occasion. Great. One last, one last question. I, I really agree with a lot of what you said, but my feeling at the time of the referendum and looking at uh, the press broadly, what people were voting for was against immigration. Yeah. 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 You know, in the in the, the broadsheets, the banner headline immigration over a ninety day period was about five. Mm. In the Daily Mail, the Star, the Sun, etc., it was over eighty time out of ninety days. And in that Britain mm. is surely at one with Europe. Well, that's why, and that's why I say it. I mean, I think there is a much better moment now to fashion solutions on immigration, which are not throwing up the barriers and closing the whatevers, but a managed immigration regime that, you know, matches labor needs and, and, and matches our responsibilities under refugee conventions to, to the flows. So I think there is a much greater opportunity for, for a regime which restores people's confidence. But I think the other side of the argument got completely lost, which is, you know, if you take the NHS, the argument was all about they're stealing our hospital beds, you know, they're here and having their babies here, whatever, you know. And the tabloids were reckless and wrong and disgraceful in what they said. Now people are seeing that actually there is a depletion of the nurses, the doctors. Uh, under any Brexit scenario, it will impact very heavily on spending on the National Health Service. So the argument on the side of the bus of 350 million a week extra, you know, is exposed as wrong. So, you know, I, I think already, even without an effective debate around this,
the, the sort of the lies of the tabloids are, are beginning to get exposed. And in that sense, probably the single most important political development of the last few weeks is not, you know, the fall of another cabinet minister or something. Um, it's Mr. Dacre's retirement to his grouse moor in Scotland from, uh, the, from the pages of the Daily Mail. Look, I'm afraid you've got to comment. I'm going to invite you to come and make it over wine and refreshments in the forum. Um, I want to say again, you're, um, you're very welcome guests here in the Blavatnik School of Government. We're delighted to have you here with us. I hope you'll come and enjoy a drink and a debate with each other as well as with our speaker. But before we do that, could you join me in thanking Lord Mark Malik-Brown for his very fine remarks. <laughs>